Welcome to our second carbohydrate video. In the first video, we saw several things about carbohydrates, including their formulas, but of course, we didn't talk about their structures. And um, in this video, I'll be interested in the reactions of glucose mainly. Then I'll also tell you about what we call our um, mutual rotation of glucose. I'll tell you about those and um, they will be the main components of this video. Now this is glucose, like we saw in the first video. And for the sake of um, the reactions we are going to be looking at, I'm going to use this structure for glucose. I'm going to write CHO, then down here, CH2OH. I'll write my glucose like this. So in that case, it will mean that the asymmetric carbons have all been hidden. And I've hidden them, that's because during the reaction, it is just these two carbons that could react. They are the ones that react in most cases. So I've hidden the others to make my um, structure easier so that I don't have to draw this each time. So I'll be using that one for glucose, all right? Now, having explained how we have that simple structure to be used as the structure of glucose, see what we have. This is glucose now, CHO, CH2OH. The first reaction of glucose we would like to talk about is redox, that is reduction and oxidation. If glucose is reduced and if glucose is oxidized, what do we get? I'm going to write all at once, so I have CHO once more and CH2OH. Now in this first case, this is glucose. If treated with a reducing agent, let's say LIALH4, if glucose were to undergo reduction, we could use this, we could use um, hydrogen with a catalyst. And the more important thing is the alcohol group cannot be reduced further by a reducing agent like this. So it is the alkanal group on top that suffers reduction. It will be reduced into a primary alcohol group like that, CH2OH, so that carbon 6 remains CH2OH. Remember that carbons 2 to 5 are in here and they are not altered in any way. We said the change would usually be either on carbon 1 or on carbon 6. So in this case, carbon 6 is intact, whereas carbon 1 is reduced to a primary alcohol group. We call this compound glucitol. Glucitol is also called sorbitol. So reduction of glucose gives, if you were asked, sorbitol, which is glucitol. Now for oxidation, there are two scenarios. There's the case where we use a mild oxidizing agent like KMNO4, like bromine water, like um, Felix reagent. All of those are mild oxidizing agents. And then there are cases where we use strong oxidizing agents like HNO3. So this is a strong oxidizing agent. That's a mild oxidizing agent. For the mild oxidizing agent, it will oxidize the alkanal group into an acid. Remember that alkanals, when oxidized, become alkanoic acids. So CHO has become COOH. Whereas the CH2OH persists, it remains. In this case, we say that what has been formed is called gluconic acid. And gluconic acid is one of the aldonic acids. What are the aldonic acids? The aldonic acids are formed when aldoses undergo oxidation with mild oxidizing agents. Then in this other case, in this other case, see our glucose with a strong oxidizing agent, we get COOH on 1 and COOH on 6. So that because the oxidation, um, oxidizing agent is powerful, it oxidizes both carbon 1 and carbon 6. So that we now have a product that we can call glucaric acid. Glucaric acid is one of the aldaric acids so in summary when we reduce glucose we get glucitol 
But when we oxidize glucose, depending on how strong the oxidizing agent is, we could get gluconic acid or we get glucaric acid. So that's about oxidation and reduction of glucose. Up next, reaction with hydrogen cyanide. When glucose reacts with hydrogen cyanide, it gives us an opportunity to extend or increase the length of the um, carbon chain in glucose. So generally, it is said that if you were to elongate a sugar, if you were to make a sugar longer, then you could think of using hydrogen cyanide. So this is CHO. Let's open it up. Let's put it this way, like double bond O and then single bond H. Either way, that's CHO. Then on number six, we have CH2OH. Now this is reacting with KCN and HCl. Like we already said, we cannot put HCN into this reaction directly because HCN is poisonous. But this combination will give you HCN. So it can be assumed that this guy is reacting with hydrogen cyanide. Like we said in the carbonyls one video, the first video on carbonyls compound, we said this CN and the HCl, that is these two things, when they react to produce HCN, this reaction will proceed in such a way that this H becomes attached to the O, this double bond becomes single, and this CN can then attack that carbon. So that my product will actually be CN, C, OH, and H, then all the way to CH2OH. So that while this compound has six carbons, that one actually has seven. So we say it has been increased, it has been elongated. And we said in the carbonyls video, carbonyl compounds one, that this kind of compound is called a cyanohydrin. So cyanohydrins have the CN group as well as the OH group. So when glucose reacts with hydrogen cyanide, what do we get? What we get is simply called glucose cyanohydrine. That's the name of that compound. Now beyond that, we could have our glucose again, this time around reacting with what we call hydroxylamine. So first, let me draw the glucose. This glucose is going to react with H2NOH. Under carbonyl compounds, you may want to watch the carbonyls video, carbonyls 1, before watching this. It will help you. Now, under carbonyls 1, we saw this as one of the ammonia derivatives. And we said that when carbonyls react with it, the H2 from here and the O from there go away as water. And then the rest of the molecules will join together. Now, if I were to do that, I'll have H and then C, then double bond, this O is gone, the H2 there is gone, so I'll bring that in as NOH, and then down to carbon 6, CH2OH. In this case, I'm going to call the compound you are seeing there, glucose oxide, glucose oxide. So it is said that when carbonyl compounds react with hydroxylamine, what they form is called an oxide. It's also possible to have this same reaction occur in some other ways. Let me show you two important ways, two other ways that this reaction can occur. Very similar reactions to this. Look at this one. H, C, O, then CH2OH by convention. This time it's reacting with H2N NH2, that's hydrazine. Hydrazine this time. When glucose reacts with hydrazine, according to what we said in the carbonyls one, we said hydrazine with the carbonyl will give you hydrazone. So that O again will go with H2, so that my product will be H, and then C, then double bond, N, N, H2. On the left, I have H, oh sorry, nothing on that left anymore, it's already up here, so that down here I have CH2OH. So if you compare these two reactions now, these two are derivatives of ammonia. 
and in each case h2 has left here and o has left there so that we have water on the other side then the rest of both molecules can condense together this compound will be called glucose phenyl sorry glucose hydrazone so that's glucose hydrazone glucose hydrazone because we started with hydrazine again i would say that if you want this video to make sense to you you may need to watch the carbon house one video i'll show you one last reaction of glucose that is important after this last reaction i'll um, tell you about mutual rotation and this video will end so this reaction I'm going to show you now is um, like this, H, C, double bond O, C, O, H, H, C, H, 2, O, H. In this case, I have drawn carbons 1 and 2 of glucose, not just carbon 1. And what glucose is going to react with this time is H, 2, N, N, H, C, 6, H, 5. That substance is called hydrazine. If glucose, sorry, we saw hydrazine earlier. This is phenyl hydrazine. So if glucose were to react with phenyl hydrazine, what do we expect to happen? The H2, as usual, will pick up oxygen. But before then, this carbon 2 will be oxidized. Carbon 2 undergoes oxidation. And what is oxidation in this case? Removal of hydrogen. These two hydrogens will be removed. So that this becomes double bond O. And that means I will have two double bonds O like this. All right. So the first thing that happens is that this compound will become H, C, double bond O. Then C again, double bond O, before the end part of it comes. So how did this double bond O come about? The removal of those two hydrogens, which is oxidation. Now, by the time this reacts with phenylhydrazine, we are going to get a compound that looks like this. H, C, double bond, N, N, H, C, 6, H, 5, then C, double bond, N, N, H, C, 6, H, 5, then C, H, 2, O, H. This is our product. And this product is called glucose phenyl hydrazone. Glucose phenyl hydrazone or glucose osazone. So glucose osazone is glucose phenyl hydrazone. And that's what we get when glucose reacts with phenyl hydrazine. Mutual rotation. What is mutual rotation of glucose? Well, glucose has two anomers. We call them alpha glucose and beta glucose. If I were to draw structures very quickly, I'll draw this. This is H, that's OH, and then here I have H, OH, OH, H, H up there, then OH, then H here, and CH2OH. This is glucose. And this glucose is said to be the alpha anomer of glucose. Yeah, anomerism. Another property of glucose. We say anomerism is a condition where there are two forms of a sugar differing at one carbon only. And that carbon is called the anomeric carbon. So like in this case, the OH here is down. We say this is the alpha anomer of glucose. If I take this OH up and bring H down, what we have will be called the beta anoma. So this is alpha glucose. So what would beta glucose be like? Everything remains OH up, H down. That becomes beta glucose. Now, if I take any of these two forms of glucose, alpha and beta, and I put it into water, I make a solution of it, something interesting happens in that I put in only alpha, after some time, when I check what I have in solution, it will be a mixture of alpha and beta. That is, some of the alpha would open up and rearrange, close up to become beta. Some of the beta too would open up, rearrange and close up to become alpha. So that we have something like an equilibrium system. Equilibrium is established. And by the time we reach equilibrium, 
if we check we see that we have the alpha and the beta not in equal amounts though some put their values at um, 6436 but it's not compulsory that we have that ratio but the most important thing is that we put only one of the anomas into solution and we end up having the two by way of what we call mutual rotation. So we say it goes from one anoma to the other, from the other to the one, and at the end of the day, we have the two anomas in solution. Ordinarily, this anoma has a specific rotation around 17. That has a specific rotation around 112 degrees. But when the two get into solution, sorry, when one of them gets into solution, and it's able to anomerize, it's able to undergo a mutual rotation to form the other so that we now have the two of them in solution. If you measure the specific rotation of this mixture now, you get it somewhere around plus 52.2 degrees. So we're trying to say that this has a specific rotation that has it. If we put any of them, pick anyone, put into water, after some time, the two of them will be in that solution. And the new specific rotation of that mixture will be neither of their specific rotations, but will have its own value. So each time glucose enters water and forms its anomal like this to have a new specific rotation, we say it has undergone muta rotation. So that's it for the carbohydrate video. Thanks for watching. Remember to share, remember to subscribe, remember to like. Tell your friends about the channel and I'll see you in the next video which is the protein video. Once again, thanks for watching.